Hello and welcome back to another full step-by-step -step PC build guide and today I'm going to show you how to build a PC in the soft mesh delicious. Now this case is available in both black and white with a mesh or a temper glass side panel and a Gen 3 or a Gen 4 riser cable. Now I've obviously got the black version with the mesh side panel and I've also got the Gen 4 riser cable version. Now, Soft have been very kind, as well as sending me out this case to make the build guide, they've offered me a second case to give away to you guys. So the case that I'm going to be giving away is a white Gen 3 version, and if you're interested in entering the giveaway, you'll find all the details you need in the description. So let's take a look at the other parts I've chosen for today's build. For the motherboard, I'm going to be using the ROG Strix Z690 iGaming Wi-Fi. For the CPU, I'm going to be using one of Intel's 12th Gen Alderdick chips, it's the 12700K. Keeping our CPU cool, I'm going to be using a 240mm AIO from Cooler Master. It's their Master Liquid PL240 Flux. For RAM, I've got 32GB of Kingston Fury Beast DDR5 at 5200MHz. For storage, I'm going with a single Gen 4 NVMe M.2 SSD from Sabrand. It's their Rocket 4 Plus in 2TB capacity. Powering the whole build, I've got an 850W Gold SFX power supply from FSP. It's the Dagger Pro. And for the graphics card, I'm going to be using the ASUS ROG Strix RTX 3080. Okay, that's all the parts. Let's get on with the build. The first thing I want to do is prepare our case. As we go, I'll point out the main case features. Our side panel is held on with push pins, so it can simply just be pulled away. The other side panel is removed in exactly the same way. And our front panel can be pulled off from the front. Just before we remove the top panel, I want to point out the case's I.O. So we've got a power button, a single USB Type-C, and a single USB Type-A. And our top panel is removed in exactly the same way. Just pop it off and lift away. And then we can remove the case accessory box. So this is everything that comes in the accessory bag. So we've got a bracket here that we can mount two 3.5 inch drives or four 2.5 inch drives too. We've got this metal rod which you're going to need if you reconfigure the case from 3 slot GPU mode to 4 slot GPU mode, more on that later on. We've got a rubber spacer for installing your power supply, a right angled HDMI cable, I'll show you why we need this later on in the build. We've got a bag of screws and rubber mounts for installing drives. I'm not going to go into this all individually but there's a really nice diagram in the manual which shows you where you use each of these for. We've got some cable ties for cable management. We've got some spare clips for securing our panels. And we've got our user guide. Giving you a quick orientation in the case, so we've got a sandwich style layout. So on this side, we're going to install our motherboard at the top. We've got four standoffs and our power supply down at the bottom. On the other side of the case, we're going to install our graphics card. And you can see the riser cable that's been pre-installed. At the front of the case is where we're going to install either our radiator or fans, and we can install either two 140 or 220 millimeter fans, or a 240 or 280 millimeter radiator. Now there's a bracket on the front of the case which is set up for 120 millimeter fans or a 240 millimeter radiator. If you want to go with either 140 millimeter fans or a 280 millimeter radiator, you're going to need to remove the bracket. The bracket's held on with three screws on each side. So just before I remove the bracket, I've loosened the three screws and what you'll notice our 120mm fan bracket, our 240mm radiator bracket is now mobile. So you are going to be able to adjust the position of your 120mm fans or 240mm radiator. If I go ahead and remove the screws, so that's what the 120mm fan or 240mm radiator brackets look like. With it removed, we're now able to mount 140mm fans or a 280mm radiator. As we're going with the 240mm radiator, I'm going to put this back in. I only removed it just to show it to you. To make the building process a little bit easier, we can remove the front frame on the motherboard side of the case. So we've got two screws at the front and two screws at the top at each side. And we've also got an additional screw at the back behind this metal bar to remove. With all the screws removed, we should simply be able to slide the top frame down and away. You'll notice at the bottom of the case we've got rubber mounts for installing SSDs. So we can install two SSDs at the bottom of the case. 
We'll line the drives up and then all you would need to simply do is screw them in from the bottom using the screws in the accessory box. And our second SSD is going to go over here. We've got a third SSD mount here so we can mount an SSD here behind our power supply and we would just again screw it in from the back. Now, whether you can put an SSD here depends on the type of power supply you're going to be using. If you're going to be using an SFX power supply, you can obviously do this. If you're going to be using a full-sized ATX power supply, there's not space for this SSD. Importantly, you're obviously going to want to install your SSDs first before installing your power supply. So our power supply is going to go at the bottom, and as you'd expect with a case of this size, it supports SFX and SFXL power supplies. But what you mightn't expect is we can actually fit a full-sized ATX power supply in the case. By default, the case is set up for SFX and SFXL power supplies with an SFX bracket on the back. So to install our SFX power supply, all we would need to do is put this little rubber pad at the bottom. It's got some double-sided adhesive on it. And then we can slide our SFX power supply in and it's going to line up with the bracket at the back of the case. And you can see here we're going to have plenty of room for our cables. This is the SFX bracket that I was talking about. It's held on with four screws and we've got three options we can do with it. The first is leave it in its current position which will let us install an SFX or SFL power supply down near the bottom of the case. We have also the option to reposition the bracket to the other side which is going to let us install the power supply slightly higher up. I'll show you that. So I can now rotate this bracket round and bring it up towards the top. So now if we slide our SFX power supply in and line it up with the holes on the bracket, you'll notice that our SFX power supply is installed slightly higher up. So the main reason you may want to do this, if you've got fairly short cables and they won't actually reach where you want them in the case, being able to move the SFX power supply up is going to help your cables reach. The third option that we have is to remove the SFX bracket and that's going to allow us to install an ATX power supply. So in terms of the maximum length for ATX power supply support, it really depends what sort of cooling you're going for at the front. So if you've got a radiator and fans at the front with the tubes down, the maximum length for the power supply is 150 millimeters. Again, a radiator and fans at the front, but this time you're gonna have the tubes at the top. You're allowed up to 160 millimeters in terms of length. If you're going to just have fans at the front, the maximum length for an ATX power supply is up to 170 millimeters. So it might seem attractive to put an ATX power supply into this case because you can and it's going to save you a little bit of money, but you may run into some issues. As we've mentioned, the first issue you might run into is cooling compatibility at the front and difficulty reading your cables. The other issue I think you may run into is cable management. The cables that come with an ATX power supply are much longer than those with an SFX or SFXL power supply because they're designed to be rooted in a much bigger case. Um, so my recommendation would be to go with an SFX power supply for ease of cable management, even though it's going to cost you a little bit more. So we're going to be installing an SFX power supply, so I'm going to remove this ATX power supply and put our SFF bracket back into its default position. Moving over to the GPU side of the case, we've got two options for installing our GPU. If you've got a longer GPU, you're going to want to install it in the vertical orientation using the pre-installed riser cable. We do have some PCIe slots here, and it is possible to mount the graphics card in a horizontal position and then use an additional riser cable to connect it up to the motherboard. The position that you install the GPU in is adjustable, so the GPU is going to rest on these metal rods and plug into the riser cable here. And for each of the holes in the riser cable, there's one at the top and one at the bottom. And for the metal rod at the bottom, we've actually got three holes. Um, the rods and the riser cables are currently installed in the middle hole. Um, but there is an option to move this up towards the top um, and move this up as well to the top hole. And that's going to give you more space at the bottom for plugging your cables into the GPU. If you have got a larger GPU, there is also the option to move these down to the bottom hole and again move the riser cables down to the bottom hole and that's going to give you more length for your graphics card. So with the case in its default position, a graphics cards up to 322 millimeters in length are supported. If we move the rods and the riser cables down to the bottom slots, graphics cards up to 332 millimeters are supported so you're getting yourself an extra centimeter of support. 
If we move things up towards the top to make more space for plugging cables in at the bottom, we're losing a centimetre of support, so we're down to 312 millimetres in length. So what I'll do now is I'll show you how to adjust this should you need to do it. So there's a screw on the back of each of these rods that we need to remove. So you can see here down at the bottom our screw is installed in the middle hole but we've got a hole below and a hole above. So all I'm going to do is remove the screw. I'm then going to bring the metal rod, which is now free, down to the bottom hole. Same thing with our other rod, so I'm going to loosen up the screw, bring the rod down to the bottom hole. Okay, same thing with the riser cable, so we'll remove the screws from the bottom. Then we can slide our riser cable down, lining it up with the bottom holes, and then re-secure it into place. So we now take a look at the other side. You can see the metal rods are down at the bottom. We've got two holes above it, and our riser cable is also down at the lowest setting as well, which should give us the maximum length for our graphics card. So with the case set in this position, we're going to be able to install a longer graphics card, but the thickness of the graphics card is going to remain the same at up to 63 millimeters. There is a way to reconfigure the case from three slot mode to four slot mode, which will let you get an extra two centimeters to the thickness of your graphics card. So graphics cards up to 83 millimeters in thickness will be supported. To do this, we need to move this panel further this way. So first of all, we need to free it up. We've got a screw at the bottom, a screw at the top and two at the side. So the screw is removed, this middle panel in the case is now free. You can see it clips through this notch here. We've got another notch over here and additional screw holes here and here. So I'm just going to slide out of this notch, move it over to the side. It's going to clip through this notch and then we're going to be able to screw it into place again. At the back of the case, we're going to need to move this panel. It's held on with two screws. So we can slide the panel over to the side, so we'll put it into the inside, slide it past this gap, and then it's going to clip into here, and then we'll replace the screws. An important point to mention about when we're attaching our front frame, we're going to have to change out the metal rod for the one that comes in the accessory box. Because we have moved this further towards the front, the rod that's currently attached to the front frame is going to be too long. So it's this little one in the accessory box that we're going to have to replace it with, and then the front frame is going to fit. So you can see now with our case in four slot mode, we've got much more space for our graphics card. That does, however, come at a cost, and the cost is on the other side of the case. Because we have moved this panel further this way, our space on this side has been reduced by two centimeters. So now the maximum height of CPU killers is down to 53 millimeters from 57 millimeters. Now, I think our graphics card should fit with it in three slot mode, so I'm gonna go ahead and put this back to the default configuration. Next thing I want to do is show you how to install a graphics card horizontally at the top. To do this, we need to remove the riser cable and the two metal supports at the bottom. It's done exactly the same way as I showed you how to move it up and down. So it's just a screw at the back for each of these and two screws for the riser cable. So I'll go ahead and remove those now. So with the vertical GPU cable and bracket removed, we can install a small form factor GPU in the horizontal position. So it's slide in like this. Obviously you'd need to remove the bracket covers at the side and then screw it in from the bottom holding it in place. There's a separate 18 centimeter riser cable that you're going to need to connect it up to the motherboard. The one that comes with the case isn't long enough to do it. The other limitation that you're going to have, as well as having to purchase another riser cable, is that graphics cards only up to 211 millimeters are supported without the front radiator in place. Um, if you do want to put the front radiator in, the graphics card's obviously going to have to be significantly smaller. So there's a lot of disadvantages to installing your graphics card horizontally. There is one other advantage, and that is that you're going to be able to use this bracket to mount two 3.5-inch drives or four 2.5-inch drives. So the bracket simply slots into place here, and then we're going to use three of the smaller screws from the accessory box to secure it into place. So that's the bracket in place. I've got a 2.5-inch drive, and I've secured one of the little rubber mounts with the 2.5-inch drive SSD mounting screws. So all I need to do is slide it into place, let the little rubber mount go in, and then I've got one of the screws, the same ones I would secure the motherboard to the case with, 
and I'm just going to secure it in at the top. So you can see the main advantage of installing your graphics card horizontally, you're going to be able to fit four two and a half inch drives on this bracket. And when you consider there's another two spaces at the bottom, one behind the SFX power supply, giving you a total of seven two and a half inch drives in a case of this size is incredibly impressive. Obviously, I'm not going to be installing the two and a half inch drive. We've got a really large graphics card that we're going to need to install vertically. So I'm going to put this back to the stock configuration. We're now ready to start working the motherboard and the first thing I want to do is get our CPU installed. So we need to push this lever down and out and all the way to the top and then we can open the cover. Then we can set our CPU into the socket, lining the notches at the top and the bottom of the CPU up or the notches on the socket and making sure the text is the correct way up. Then we can close the cover over. If we apply a little bit of pressure here, the black plastic will pop off. We're going to put this into the motherboard box and then we can close the lever all the way down and back in underneath the clip. Next we can install the backplate for our CPU cooler. And then we've got one of these standoffs to screw on to each corner. To install our M.2 SSD we're going to need to remove the heatsink. We can then insert our drive into the slot at a slight angle, flatten it down and then we've got this little clip here to close which is going to secure our drive into place. If you're using the motherboard for the first time you're going to have some plastic protection on the back of the heatsink to remove. I've used this before, that's why there's none there. We are now ready to install the RAM so we can open the clips on both slots. Then we need to line the RAM up with the slot. Once we're happy we've got everything lined up, it's just some firm pressure to the RAM. It's going to clip into place and the clip will close. The same thing with our second stick. Next we can insert our motherboard into the case, lining it up with the standoffs beneath. We're then going to use four of these screws with a little lip around the outside to secure the motherboard to the case. We can then open the PCIe slot on our motherboard. We can then remove the cover from the riser cable. Line things up with the slot beneath. And once we're happy everything's lined up, apply some firm pressure. The riser cable is going to slot into place and the clip closes. The next thing I want to do is get our case cables plugged in, starting off with our front panel connectors. So we've got a power switch, a hard drive LED and power LED connectors. Now we've got two options for this. Um, as our motherboard comes, the only connector that's on the motherboard is a two-pin connector for the power switch. If we want to get access to the full front panel connectors, we need to add this little add-in card in. So it just lines up here and pushes into place. And this is our front panel connector on the top of the add-in card. There's a diagram in the motherboard manual which shows you which pins each of the cables goes into. Now I don't particularly want the light flashing for a hard drive indicator LED and I don't necessarily need power LED at the expense of having to install this add-in card. So I'm going to remove the card and all I'm going to do is take our power switch and plug it into the two pin header behind this connector here. So this is going to let me use the power button at the top of the case to turn the PC on and off. If you want these other functions to work, use the add-in card and use the diagram in the motherboard manual to help you decide which of the pins you plug things into. Next we've got our USB Type-C connector and then our USB 3.0 cable. Just before we install our power supply we have this little rubber pad to put down the bottom. So we peel the plastic off the back. And then I'm just going to set it down here at the bottom of the case. This is our power supply. It's fully modular. It comes without any of the cables plugged in. I've gone ahead and plugged them in now. So I've plugged in our 24 pin cable, a single CPU cable and two PCIe cables. Each of the PCIe cables has two 6 plus 2 pin connectors, which gives us a total of four 8 pin connectors and our graphics card is going to require three. Importantly, we're going to want to install our power supply with the fan facing out towards the mesh panel where it's going to get plenty of fresh air. So we can set the power supply into place. 
line it up with the holes at the back of the case. We're then going to want to use four of these larger screws to secure the power supply into place. Next I'm going to route our CPU cable up behind the motherboard and then get it plugged into the header at the top. And then we'll pull the excess cable down to the bottom of the case. I'm also going to bring our 24 pin cable up and get it plugged into the header on the motherboard. We've got one CPU cable that we're not going to use and I'm just going to route our graphics card cables through to the other compartment. Next I want to install our graphics card so I'm going to open the slot on our riser cable by pulling this clip out to the side. We can then slide our graphics card into place. I'm going to line the graphics card up with the riser cable. Once I'm happy it's lined up I'm going to push it into place and then I'm going to close this clip to secure it where it is. Not the easiest bit to show you, but we want to use two of the same screws we used to secure our power supply to secure the graphics card to the metal rod. We are also going to want to secure our graphics card to the other metal rod using a thumb screw through the middle hole. I also want to show you how to plug in the right angled HDMI cable that comes with the case. So we're going to want to pass it through this cutout at the back and then bring it down over the metal rod and out the cutout at the bottom of the case. We're then able to plug the cable into the HDMI connector on the graphics card. So now you can see with a right angled HDMI cable installed it's not going to be protruding from the bottom of the case. We can then plug in our three PCIe cables to the graphics card. We are now ready to start working the I.O. and the first thing to do is set the fans on. So I'm going to want the fans set to intakes that are going to be pulling air in from the front of the case. And we're also going our fan cables coming out towards the motherboard side. So setting them on this way with tubes down is going to work. We've then got these long thumb screws to secure the fans to the radiator. I'm going to show you how to connect everything up on the table because it's going to be much easier than when we put things into the case. So coming from each fan we've got two connectors. We've got a standard 4 pin PWM fan connector and a 3 pin 5 volt ARGB connector. So starting off with our PWM fan connectors we get a double fan splitter cable so I'm going to plug them into that. That now means we've now got one 4 pin PWM fan connector to plug into our CPU fan header on the motherboard. So Cooler Master also include a triple ARGB splitter cable. So we can take one of the connectors coming from the fan, line it up, make sure we've got it around the right way, and push it in to the cable. Cooler Master also include these little covers which you can push over the top and it just prevents the cable becoming separated. Okay, same thing with our other fan, make sure we've got it around the right way, line it up, and then we'll put the cover on. Moving on to look at our pump, we've also got two connectors coming from it. One is a 4 pin PWM connector which we're going to plug onto the IIO header on our motherboard. The other is another 3 pin 5 volt ARGB connector and fortunately we do have one connector left on our triple splitter cable so we can connect it up and then we've got a little cover to go over to the top. So the end of this cable is then going to go into a 3 pin 5 volt ARGB header on our motherboard. So I think we're going to struggle to get our AIO in with the cables in their current state. So I'm going to do a bit of cable management before we install the AIO. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to use a cable tie here just to tidy the cables coming from our GPU. We can then slide the AIO into the case in a tubes down position. In terms of installing the radiator, I'd like to get it as high up as possible. Um, that's as high as I can push it so it isn't quite meeting where the brackets are. So what I'm going to do is loosen the brackets and bring them down a little bit. So we should be able to slide this bracket down now, line it up with the holes on the case, and then I'm going to fix the radiator to the bracket. Now I've got the radiator attached to the bracket, I'm just going to push the radiator and bracket up together as high as I can get it and then we'll secure the bracket to the case. Next I can add some thermal paste to the CPU. Now if you're using your CPU cooler for the first time you'll have some plastic protection on the cold plate. I've used this before which is why I don't need to remove it. So I'm just going to line the cooler up with the standoffs we secured to the motherboard earlier on. 
Then we've got one of these thumb screws to go onto each corner. And then we'll tighten things up with a screwdriver. Next we need to plug the PWM cable coming from our fans into the CPU fan header. The PWM connector coming from our pump is going to go into the I.O. header at the top of the motherboard. Then we need to plug our 3-pin 5-volt ARGB connector coming from our I.O. into our ARGB header on our motherboard, which is just here above our riser cable. Okay, last thing to do is some cable management. We need to get these cables tidied up so we can get our panels back on again. So that's the build complete and from the footage you've just seen I think you'll agree with me that it looks great. Now this case has been out for quite some time so I'm not going to make a full case review. What I'm going to do now is share the temperatures with you and my thoughts on having built on the Mesh Alicious. So in terms of temperatures our CPU idled at 30 degrees and reached a maximum of 74 degrees during a 10 minute IDA 64 stability test. Our GPU idled at 35 degrees and reached a maximum of 68 degrees during the IDA 64 stability test. Noise levels were very acceptable with 30 decibels at idle and 45 decibels under load. So to put those temperatures into context, I have done a few small form factor builds recently where exactly the same CPU was running at over 100 degrees and had really significant thermal throttling. It was also being cooled by a 240mm AIO, although it was a different one to this one. This one from Cooler Master is really, really good if you're looking for a good 240mm AIO. Now, as well in the Lian Li O11 Dynamic Evo, I used exactly the same CPU and GPU. The CPU temperatures I was getting, some of the best temperatures in that case, were very similar to the CPU temperatures we were getting in this case. And in terms of the GPU temperatures, they were running somewhere between 2 and 5 degrees cooler. So for a case of this size, the temperatures that we're getting are absolutely exceptional. So well done to SUPT, they've come up with an absolutely brilliant case. Um, as well, building in this case was really, really straightforward. Um, if I was doing things again, would I do anything differently? Um, and probably not. Um, the only real tip that I have for building, it was really straightforward following their instruction manual. They're very, very good instructions was I had started off to do some cable management before installing the AIO at the front. Um, if I was doing that again, I would leave the cable management till after the AIO was in because it was really quite difficult with the cables already managed. But that would be the only thing that I would do slightly different. So I can definitely recommend the Supt Mesh Alicious if you're in the market for a small form factor case. I really enjoyed building it and I'm really delighted with the PC that we've come up with in the end. So remember about the giveaway that we're doing. Um, we're going to give a white PCIe Gen 3 version of the case away. If you'd like to win that, you'll find the details of how to enter the giveaway in the description. As well, if you've enjoyed this video, please remember to give it a thumbs up. If you're not currently subscribed to the channel, please hit the subscribe button as well. And I'll see you in the next video.